This is the Daily Tech News Show for Thursday, December 24th, 2015. I'm Tom Merritt, and uh, I'm alone, but I'm not alone. In fact, I have the entire year with me because this is our best of 2015 show. Wait, what? what is Darren doing here? I thought I would be doing Darren this alone here. just to myself. Hmm. This is the first daily tech news show of 2015, and the show's now a year old. I'm Todd Merritt. Happy New Year. And that's how 2015 began with DTNS contributor Darren Kitchen, who showed up on his day off. Uh, it was a fitting start for what turned out to be the year of the contributor. You know, welcome to 2015. Every brand wants to be cool. The, the packets don't care. And then, Veronica, you got sent the Emoji English Dictionary. The more people I know, the more I love dogs. Which is up, dot, 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 two people, up, heart, dog, dog. Dog, dog. <laughs> and I bet you Phil Spencer could produce a pretty good album. Yeah, it'd be all right. And still I hope he has nothing else in common with Phil Spencer, though. <laughs> uh, Indonesian press. And gaming on mobile, however much people say is the next big thing, is not as big as, well, it doesn't attract the gamers that enjoy gaming as a, a specific hobby. It attracts gamers at, that, that do this as a pastime of sorts. I got to finish my laundry. Really? Really, just tell us, just tell really? us you have to wash your hair, Len. Geez. No, I get. Well, I like the meatloaf and fish fry excuses here, better. You're losing the, your creativity. As always, the year in tech began at CES. We actually are going to have the three stages of CES on this show. We've got yeah. me avoiding it, Molly on her way to it, and Tim. <laughs> Tim's already it. over it. Yeah. Tim already over. Already over it. <laughs> you wouldn't believe the lengths uh, that Patrick Norton has gone to to help Jenny Josephson get this going uh, live from CES. But you guys are there. Thank you so much. It's awesome. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a pleasure to watch you work. It was tapes you know. and tools and general tinkering involved. It was insane. Our first new DTNS contributor of the year, Patrick Beja, had some strong things to say about the Internet of Things. I am really unimpressed by uh, Samsung's vision and the way they're selling it. It seems to me they're sort of doing things in a futurologist way, like they're showing us fancy videos with tomorrow is now and tomorrow is beautiful in the future you will be able to sit on a chair that talks to your monitor the future they're selling us is really expensive and it's not simple and even stronger things to say about pretty much everything else if you take a, a step back microsoft is in the media at least way more important than it was under balmer and that's already in itself something that's really important. Uh, we're hearing about Microsoft doing bold things that some people have questions about them, but I don't think anyone is saying this is completely ridiculous and he's going to sink the company. The next DTNS contributor, Justin Robert Young, showed that his intelligence was far from artificial when talking about artificial intelligence. When you uh, read some of this and you talk about like making sure that this form of life is subjugated and, and docile, you can't bring it close to human understanding without thinking of other times where we have talked about human beings being subjugated and, and docile and better for us uh, and, and not for themselves. Although what themselves would be is something that is unquantifiable right now. So it, it's, it, it, it's fascinating, but really terrifying when when really smart people are kind of worried about this and and in the midst of Elon Musk uh having a huge uh, moment for his his uh SpaceX company the next tweet he writes about is another pet issue for him which is the danger of the coming AI now the fascination is not we can save everything it's what can we delete you know Snapchat is uh, you know becomes popular at least in its uh, initial offering because it because it is ephemeral. I feel like 
there are a lot of assumptions that we made six months ago with this conversation, including, let's go back to January when that first Verizon uh, ruling came down, and now all the headlines were, congratulations, welcome to the doomed internet. The only person who can stand in the way of, of, of total destruction now is this pawn, lackey, bought and sold a puppet commissioner in Tom Wheeler. Is, is Tom Wheeler's future in the Senate or in the White House? I mean, this is either he had this huge change of heart or he is a far more skilled politician than any of us had really initially when we were calling him a puppet lackey sellout suck up uh, had any uh, concept of. He is, this is Frank Underwood level smart and I personally believe he'll be our president in a year and a half. Because here's the problem is, is you know, that wasn't the place or the time. I can't just come on the Daily Tech News show. You've entrusted me to show a different element of my personality that I, ne I don't really get a chance to do on a lot of other shows where I could dust off my degree from the SI Newhouse School of Public Communications located in Syracuse, New York. Uh, but when, when you really break it down, what you got to focus on is the fact that Taylor Swift, okay, writes a, a, a tumblog, right, about Apple Music. So here we go. Taylor Swift, Apple Music. Taylor Swift, Apple Music. And you think that that's a connection. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. It's, it's on a Tumblog, right? What's Tumblog? What, what Tumblr is uh, what they're owned by? Yahoo. Marissa Meyer runs Yahoo. What did Marissa Meyer do today? Marissa Meyer went and said that they're going to have their search in with JavaScript. So now where does JavaScript get worked in? You think that maybe it's just going to be Marissa Meyer and Taylor Swift got into a room and said, hey, how is this Apple Music going to thing go down? Meanwhile, JavaScript comes in and says, I think that we need to make sure that all these indie artists get paid because I like to enjoy music that I hear at a bar one day. Okay, so JavaScript comes in and says that's what's going to go down. So Marissa Meyer goes back to Taylor Swift. She writes on a tumble log. Next thing you know, Eddie Q's halfway through a rum runner and his phone goes off and he says, what the hell's going on? Falls into the pool, wakes up and says, okay, let's go ahead and get Taylor Swift on Apple Music. Oh my God. Bravo. I like it. And of course it wouldn't be a DTNS Friday without the classic duo of Darren Kitchen and Len Peralta. Tom, do you know what happens when a packet with a TTL of 54 reaches that 54th hop? Yeah. Do you know what happens? It's murder. It's like, yes, it is. It is it's absolutely like, I, then it's like a great disturbance in the network as if millions of packets suddenly cried out in terror and then were suddenly silenced. Or dropped. <laughs> yes, but, but, they just dropped to the floor. I'll always remember the uh, watching uh, Wrath of Khan and just not believing that a character like Spock could die. Um, and now we're reliving it for real. So I just thought it was very fitting for me to draw what I, what I took out of that and what I take out of this entire thing. Of course, his last words, his last tweet, and then this image of not really, it's not Kirk, but it's just anybody. Actually, it was, it's supposed to be your hand, Tom. That's how I worked yourself in there, but... Um, but it says any any of us who are reaching out, and you know he's behind this glass. Um, just kind of a poignant image uh, for today's show. So I just thought it was very fitting. And all the while, we got tantalizing hints about what DTNS could be with a full set of contributors, like this discussion about Cuba with Veronica Belmont. I mean, we've known about this for a while because we've heard about these things like called a paquete seminal, the USB drives that are delivered each week to, to customers or to uh, distributors where they basically plug in a bunch of TV shows, movies, newspaper articles, magazines, pretty much any media you can think of from the outside world, bring it into Cuba. Uh, I think they probably, someone has a connection, a decent connection to the outside world who is then putting it onto a USB drive that is then being disseminated throughout the country. Um, because internet is a major problem there, of course. We've had, uh, they do not have easy access to the outside internet. Um, internet connections are available at cafes around the country, but it is very expensive. People have been setting up um, nodes, internet nodes throughout the country. Now, this is not technically legal, um, but the government kind of lets it slide a little bit because they have, they self-regulate. It's especially fascinating because they're making it happen on their own. You know, they're not having the, the big support of a company like a Google or a Verizon or an AT&T. None of that has happened yet, though. Now that the sanctions have been taken away, hopefully that will 
start happening, though a lot of people are going to lose this source of income they have by creating these paquete seminals to, to pass around information on or the people who are being paid to manage the nodes. As we climbed closer to our Scott and Veronica goal, we were joined by an amazing roster of DTNS guests. Let's punch Monday in the face. Because <laughs> I used to hate unboxing videos, and I still do, but I, I hate I hate the overproduced, let's take 20 minutes to take something out of a box because of the plastic like i can't stand those kind of videos mm -hmm. but 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 we we like like looking at other people take stuff out the box i mean I, it's a it's a real phenomenon like yeah like, it doesn't matter what it is if you got a good personality people just like your seeing your experience well your unboxing and subsequent stabbing of the alexa was one of my favorite videos. <laughs> okay. And I, I think it is unfair to say that the telcos don't want free and open internet. What they want is the uh, the freedom to put in their own uh, money making opportunities. Uh, in other words, they invested into laying these lines, and they want right. the right to make money off them however they want. They see themselves, and this is what it comes down to. They see themselves as an information service. An information service, like a cable television company, mm -hmm. says we have information that a customer wants, and we will dole out that information to the customers we deem uh, appropriate. And that is that is where the opposition is going to come. They're going to say the internet is not a telecommunication service. It's an information service. I'm not sure I buy that simply because the information isn't being provided by the telecommunication service. It's being provided by lots of other people openly. In other words, a cable company doesn't create the channels, but the cable company goes and makes deals and says, okay, we have these channels and we will now provide them. In the case, of, except in the case of Comcast, where they own NBC yeah. Universal, right? Where they're providing it. So they're saying, look, we're information. Well, and in the case of Time Warner as well. I mean, you almost wonder, was that the long game all along? <laughs> <laughs> was the long game to just go ahead and get into content so that they could be a little bit of both? We need a lot of bandwidth, right? Like, I just wrote a big story about virtual reality and the possibility of streaming virtual reality video to the home. Now, compression techniques are going to get a lot better and so on and so forth, but that's a big video, super big video. If a truly unexpected use case comes along, like, multi, you know, dozens of gigabyte size virtual reality files that people suddenly can't live without on Facebook. <laughs> you know, totally. we, want, we want the ability to say, hey, Facebook, you need, to, you need to pay us a little extra for that. When you think about it, you, you just, you, you spent, you know, pretty much, I'm sure 99% of the folks that listen to this show and any podcast tech show are the support, the administrators for their families and their friends, and you tell them, don't open emails that uh, you don't trust. Don't just give away your password. Don't change your password. Update your machines. And it just doesn't, it's really starting to realize that it doesn't matter anymore because they're just, a, you're being attacked from everywhere, from stuff that you can't even control uh, is, is being attacked. I'm glad to see Microsoft taking some steps. Um, they've been traditionally so bad that uh, it's a good sign. Um, I've got a, a good friend who's in a wheelchair and, and has accessibility problems from a, from a mobility standpoint, and when, when Windows 8 came out, it was completely and entirely inaccessible to him, where Windows 7 was accessible to him. He, he makes his living on Windows. And, uh, and they had all these references still to things like the Start button. So they very clearly didn't even look at the accessibility features before putting out Windows 8. What has happened as a result of the technology in our lives? And I, I hear a lot of people say, well, it's ruined your, local, your friendships. And I realize for me, it has fallen into three categ categories. Because of the technology, I have friends I wouldn't have if it weren't for the internet. I would not be friends with Tom Merritt if it weren't for the internet. Right. So and then in May, our contributor roster was complete. Joining me today in his first time as an official co-contributor, co-conspirator, and co-awesome guy, Mr. Scott Johnson of the Frog Pants Network. Tom Merritt, I could not be happier to be here. Thank you so much, and huge thanks to the patrons who made it possible. Joining me today in her first day as a newly minted DTNS contributor, co-host of Sword and Laser and Regional Parallel Parking Champion, Veronica Belmont. How Hello, are you? I'm excellent. How are you, Tom? I am well. We did it! Or did they it. did it. Actually, we didn't do anything. They, the, the, the bosses did it. I think that there's definitely still situational use for emojis. I think that, you know, we're, we're not going to be writing novels in emoji for real other than to be like a cute kind of kitschy thing. Uh, not at least in the next 
10 to 20 years, I hope. Not um, in the current emoji state. Not, I, you know, not the way emojis are now. Maybe I mean, Unicom still, 358, not Unicom 7 or 8. If it can have a keyboard at this point, it's going to have emoji. And we're standardizing them and we're adding to them all the time. And I think that's, that's a good thing. I think it's good to have that common language set across all different types of technology. Um, but it is, it, it, it makes you laugh and it's kind of cheesy because they are so cutesy and they are so, you know, they're, they're, they're meant to be fun, but so people don't take them seriously. But I think there are a lot of interesting implications on what it can mean for language down the line. I, with the drone thing, I feel like we're going to get more amateur drone photography taking place in these previously unpopulated areas where bears perhaps, you know, kind of go to chill out. So, you know, just a reminder, if you have a drone and there's a fire burning nearby, land your drone. Just land your drone. Hold on, I'm going to say it one more time. If you are flying your drone near a wildfire, land your drone, and just for the heck of it, call the fire department. You know, if you see a fire with your drone, land the drone, call the fire department, let the professionals handle it. You don't need photos of the fire more than the firefighters need to put the fire out. There's no equity when it comes to user experience. And there can't be. Is there also, it's also impossible to say that someone might really like the way fa Facebook does their interface and people might really like the way Google Plus do, does and then and the never the twain shall meet. So because I could be a web designer and make a really crappy user experience and somebody else makes a better one and pulls in my feeds and content from there, it's impossible for me to do much about it except build a better experience. So what we have here is a big 900 pound gorilla with an experience people are used to and that they hang around in a lot. And then you go over to, I don't know, New York Times or somebody who's, Maybe that's not a terrible experience, but it's certainly not the same, and they're less comfortable with it, and they don't want to go out to it, wait for it to load and everything else. As a user, it makes perfect sense. As publishers and, and, and aggregators and sites and news organizations, that's where it gets a little bit hairy. So I gave you an, ex uh, an example earlier. I think I, I still stand by. I've thought about it a bit since we talked, and that is this. But when Steam came on the scene in the, in the early aughts and said, here's what we're going to do here at Valve. We have this idea. We're going to unify gaming experiences on PCs, where right now it's just kind of scattershot and all over the place. And the same fears were expressed. Oh, no, uh, you won't be, be visiting my site where we built a site to support our game. Instead, you're going to go to this unified one place, this platform, and you're going to get our game there, and we're going to have to give a share to them, those guys, and you're never going to come to see us again. And it's bad for publishers, and it's bad for everybody and players. Turns out, complete opposite happened. PC's never seen so much growth, largely in part because of what Valve did with, with Steam and its continued success. I've got the actual line, Scott. It was, we're working closely with Valve to make Windows 10 the best platform for VR gaming. Okay, so that's their, ter that's their terminology, and that's a thing to say, I suppose. But did anyone in their right mind anywhere on this planet think that we wouldn't be able to run the Vive or the Oculus Rift or any other PC focused de device on a Windows machine. Like I understand it's 10 and I understand it's them saying, well, we want it to be the best it can be. And th that's a lot of PR talk, but that was like announcing that uh, we want to announce today that every HP laser printer you buy is going to have drivers and windows. <laughs> like, of course it's going to work. We had a blast at Nerdtacular and Dragon Con. Does anybody no. use Translate apps? I use yeah, Google I Translate all the time because yeah. people send me messages on Twitter and I don't know what they mean. <laughs> it's probably so for the best that you don't for translate the best. them. Yeah. I, I, I'm uh, learning a lot of language that way. Yeah. <laughs> so. Encryption and security concerns were topics that recurred early and often on DTNS in 2015. Even if everybody agreed, okay, we'll have a backdoor uh, for legitimate governments to look in with a warrant, uh, you know, at certain times, that backdoor will be exploited uh, by people that you don't want to exploit. What I, I cannot abide is the disregard for uh, fundamental freedoms that the Ministry of the the Minister of the Interior is showing here. And I think what it it uh, shows is that he does realize that there is an issue with the law because he understands as that that people would care if they they knew that if they realized that all of this constitutes an infringement on fundamental freedoms so he's saying no fundamental freedoms are okay it's just privacy that we're touching and you know he's trying to have his cake and eat it too yeah. if if he was saying 
we need to attack fundamental freedoms in order to be safe. At least we could have an honest debate. And I would be okay with that. And if people still choose to agree with the law, then fine. Uh, not fine, but you know, I, I wouldn't be as outraged as I am right now. The Apple Watch and the coming of virtual reality were recurring topics too. Uh, it's always a possibility, you know, people predict doom and gloom for each new product and, <clears throat> and each time Apple proves us wrong. I, I do think this will do well, but I think it will follow a fairly slow trajectory. In fact, I, I think the trajectory will probably be similar to the original iPhone uh, because this is the kind of thing that people are going to need to see, uh, see other people using before they really think uh, that this fits in their lives. And it, and it was pretty much the same way with, uh, with the iPhone because people had smartphones before and people saw them, they were clunky and they had styluses and you know you wore them clipped on your belt and nobody wanted that. So, but then when people started to see the iPhone floating around, uh, they started to say, oh, this is, this is a very different sort of thing. But you know, this year I think it'll be a pretty niche thing, I think it'll be pretty limited sales. To me the interesting thing is that we are on the cusp of another real push for VR and it took 30 years to get here. Right, because the last time we saw this happen, there was this expectation that VR was going to be the the next iteration of computing, that it was going to become the way we would interact with computers moving forward. That's why if you watch those movies from the 90s, it always had people being put into a virtual representation of the computer, like hackers are actually going through a physical maze and encountering a skull and crossbones, and oh, that's a firewall. Um, <laughs> if only viruses were so easy to see. As, yeah, as little little nasty objects on the screen, but yeah. exactly. But but there was that thing where where we had this idea of what the experience was going to be like, and then if you actually went out and pursued the experience, you saw what a huge gap there was between our expectations and what we could truly deliver. So basically, the the simulation I did was just you know I, I put on the the headset and the gloves so I can you know do this whole bit and see astronaut hands, and it's kind of like being picked up by the scruff of your neck, really, and they just flew me around the International Space Station. And so, you know, I can kind of look down and look, oh, there's, there's the Earth, and you know, over my shoulder I can look far back in the distance, and there's the moon. Yeah, um, what are the graphics like? Like, what does it actually look like through that thing? Does it look like the best video game ever, or does it look like when you're looking at the blue marble? It's, it's... You know, the way that I put it, so, and I, and I put this in, in the story, um, I mean, it, it's not like 100% photo real, but it's so close mm -hmm. that you can really just suspend, you know, belief for a second. And they actually have this poster that's like outside of the lab that's like very large, and it's sort of this, you know, this image of the Earth and part of the space station. And so the public affairs officer I was with was telling me that, you know, it took him a really long time to realize that that wasn't a photo. And I just had this moment where I was looking at it, and I just, I got really close up to it, and I was like, oh my god, that's not a photo, you know? <laughs> so it's sharp. It's really sharp. Getting our weekly contributors meant we could start to book special guests, like Dr. Lisha Zhang. Do you also speed up the process? of getting the data because you're, you're making the request for the data and because it doesn't have to go, let's say, to a server in Japan to get it because that's where the file is, is sitting on a, on a server that you've had to call through the browser. Instead, you're saying, oh, a copy of this, an exact copy of this, or this exact file is somewhere in Texas. It's much closer in a server that's more, you know, closer to your network. Therefore, it's going to pull from the closest one. Are we saving bandwidth as well as as well as increasing the speed at which we get our data back? You are exactly right. Yes, there's a savings in multiple uh, fronts. Um, so you leave the freedom, like I said, to the network to decide, and uh, this reduce the complexity, um, reduce the uh, resource consumption, as well as increase the security. Now I agree with you. Uh, reading about this and information-centric networking. Uh, which was Van J Jacobson, who's working on name data networking. His his theorization, uh, his famous speech a few years ago, uh, makes me think that if it's not this, it's something very like this or something that comes out of this, 
uh, that helps us figure out how to solve. I mean, we didn't even get into it, but there are implications on net neutrality that make it less of an issue. Uh, there's obviously the things about security that we talked about. So I, I will be following this as well. And I know uh, there's folks out there who have the skills to contribute to this, and I encourage you to do so, named-data.net. Now, I don't do a lot of high-end cinematography using drones. Um, you know, there are definitely uh, heavy lifters that, can, that you can put red cameras on or DSLRs. Um, but my, so, so for photography stuff, that's mostly what I do. But what I do have here uh, is some of the drones that I've built, um, which are used for different purposes. So this is a combat drone which is basically a, uh, a quadcopter that um, is made, w that has a, a, you know, a relatively indestructible shell. And this is used for dogfighting. So at Maker Faire, you know, there's, there's a bunch of guys who, who put together uh, an event where two drones enter a cage and then one drone essentially leaves. Uh, <laughs> so. Like airplane, airplane dogfight, just so everybody... Uh, Correct, yes, not a fence, yeah. there's no... There's most no of, yeah, most of our listeners are on audio, so it was a quadcopter with four uh, propellers on it. Yeah. Right. No, no not animals like were hard. Kennels dogfighting. Yeah. Right, right. There's no right. Exactly. Aerial dogfighting, uh, kind of like robot wars in the air. I guess. Is oh, great. Right. So now we're saying Eddie is the Michael Vick of of drone. <laughs> but, uh, he is <laughs> definitely not. We got one more contributor this year. The man who takes the tech news and makes it thoroughly disreputable in the best possible way. Mike Range with the weekly Tech Views blog post on Saturday. He even made a book out of it. Everybody got quiet. Oh, sorry. All the fun people left. Mm. It's just us regulars now. I know, just us grumps. How am I a grump? No, I'm speaking for myself only and Tom. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. You can, uh, I... If Rogers are optimist, we're all in a lot of fucking trouble. Oh, are we still live? I'm sorry. Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Boom goes the dynamite. That's Headshot. Rather, that's rather insulting. It wouldn't be a best of show without a little bit of the post show where we pick the show titles and generally blow off steam while I edit. I'm Good show, you guys. What should we call it? That was a great show. What should we call it? That was a great show. What should we call it? Great show. What should we call it? So really, Darth Vader brings out the poetry in our chat room because we have, <laughs> I find your lack of Wi-Fi disturbing. Nice. And my favorite, this is too long, but connect to me and we can rule the internet as father and son. <laughs> um, oh, say oh hello. connect to me and we can rule the internet as yeah. client and server. Yeah. Oh my God. Minor, minor edit. Luke, am I, I am your wife, father. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That is amazing. <laughs> Lennon, I am your statue. Mm, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, come to the Wi-Fi. Side. Come to the Wi-Fi side. The thing is, like, I don't just pick the one with the most votes. I combine like votes and to, as a tiebreaker on the ones we like. So yeah. just like artificially inflating the number of votes isn't going to help you. No, this is a meritocracy, not a democracy. Oh. It's a merit, merit. <laughs> yeah, it's a merit. It's not Changarchism either. <laughs> I mean, if you want to come to my house, kill that spider. That would be awesome. But don't. Do you have a car? Because you do. Oh well, then yes. I will text you. <laughs> text me your text me your address. I'm not even joking about this. What I'm thinking we do is we take one of those glazed donuts and then we hooked like four rotors to it, and then we fly it, <gasps> but then we copter. crash it. Then we crash donut it. Copter. Then we crash it into my donut mouth. Crash. Yes. O M G. Actually, what if all of the propellers, like, what if the propellers were made out of like sugar, right? And then like it lands and it's like it's. You know, they forget make... the drone delivery. What if the drone delivery is the edible? And actually, you know what? I feel like we could just do away with the expensive <gasps> electronics because it's going to make it more drone expensive. Nut. But as long as we make the sound when we pick up our coffee cup and go... <clears throat> I feel like the uh, the RC model community is missing out because typically we're using things like carbon fiber, but it's, it's not as good. I actually have a pole in my house, but that's because my wife is Polish. Hey! Oh, but I'll, but I'll, but I'll. It's absolutely. Hey, we didn't true. mean to go racial. Jeez. I, I mean, I, I don't know why you guys have against poles. My wife's awesome. <laughs> it was the second week of the show, or and I, de maybe I demand, the first week. I, I demand a sixty percent stock, and you gave it to me, so now I'm rich. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember All that. the thousands. <laughs> Hundreds of dollars. Patriots, you are paying me, actually. Thank you. Oh, boy. Yeah. 
The whole reason we have to have stretch goals for Veronica is because of Lamar's gold plated uh, so <laughs> far. Lamar's cut. <laughs> uh, by the way, I'm going. Ellie with... almost walking, by the way. Did you see that while this was all going on? No, because I'm editing. I'm not seeing. I'm, mi- I'm missing walking. her first step, Jenny. Oh. Mm. I know. Can you imagine if Ellie walks for the first time on this show live? It would be like the Truman Show. <laughs> Star Trek. That's uh, yeah. That's the one I said. Oh, Star Trek Four. I just rewatched Four the other day. It's the best movie. It's the worst. worst. Oh, so we can fight about that too. No, no, no. It's not the worst, Scott. The worst time travel is Star Trek Five is the worst. Okay, you're right. Six. Six out of five for bad. I'm sorry, six. 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 Wait, no, wait. Five is the is where they go find God, right? Yeah. Oh, is that? I thought that was. (laughs) Six. No, Don't six is okay. I want my pain. I need my pain. Six is good. When someone asks you if you're God, you say yes. Wait, wait. Scott, <laughs> let me give you one. The, the worst part, the worst part, though, and come on, Roger, you got to agree with me here. You can't swing shot around the sun and turn time backwards. I'll agree with you there. Oh. But you know what? That's the thing, though. That that actually established that whole thing for the rest of the Star Trek universe. So if they've done it. Since then, <laughs> well, the only thing worse was red matter. Listen, you know what's fake? Going faster than the speed of light in a ship that looks vaguely like a vulture. But it's possible. <laughs> it's a warp gonna... bubble, Roger. So the shape of the ship doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't actually. Well, it doesn't space. matter if because you go when back. the dilithium crystal interact with the antimatter. <laughs> so this is the thing I don't understand about the slingshot around the sun. We could go back in time. We go faster, but you're already going faster when you hit warp speed, right? Is it yeah. warp one? Yeah, but then you add speed. <laughs> you add, at, that point, even at that point, you already should be going back in time. No, but you're going faster through normal space, not through warped space. Well, so it's very important to mention, and this is a big problem. That's a, That whole movie featured not one Enterprise ship. It was all the Vulcan ship. That's it. <laughs> it's not a Vulcan. The it's a Romulan. A Romulan. Or no, it's a bird of prey. Clean. Right? Mm-hmm. Clean on bird of prey. Yeah. yeah I meant uh, also, another thing to keep in mind, fictional. <laughs> <laughs> I can still do most of the Animaniacs. It's like United States, Canada, Mexico, and Panama, Haiti, Jamaica, Peru, Republic Dominican, Cuba, Caribbean, Haiti, El Salvador, too. See, like, it's all what you learned. Don't you hope somebody tunes Washington, in Washington, Adams, right Jefferson, now? Madison, Monroe, Adams, Jackson, Van Buren, Harrison, Tyler, Polk, Taylor, Fillmore, Pierce, Buchanan, Lincoln, Johnson, Grant, Hayes, Garfield, Arthur, Cleveland, Harrison, McKinley, Roosevelt, Taft, Wilson, Harding, Hoover, Coolidge, Hoover, Coolidge, Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford. Because I learned it in 76. <laughs> That's where it stops. Nobody came after Ford. And after oh, Ford, I could do it, but I have to think. I mean, Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush, wow. Obama. <laughs> Wow, that's that's impressive. Oh shoot, I meant to watch it in 3D. Wait, <laughs> <laughs> those are so cool. Are they? You like these? I, was I do. Sort I of saw like... Eileen. Uh, I like I like those. The BB-8 branded yeah. ones. Well, so they had Captain Phasma, Kylo Ren, Stormtrooper, and BB-8. Did I'm you like, see well, it in 3D? It's the only light side of yeah. the. Yeah. So I went for BB-8. I think that's good. Oh man! So, do you saw it? In, so you saw it in 3D then? Yeah. What'd you think in 3D? 3D or 2D? Or does it matter? Uh, it. I don't think this movie in any way changes what your opinion of 3D versus 2D is normally. Okay. Yeah. So it's like, should I see it in IMAX 3D? I'm like, can you see it in IMAX without 3D? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you like 3D, then you should probably see it in 3D. But if you normally are like, eh, I don't really care about 3D, there's nothing here that would change that. Right. I don't. Also, think. is it? It's hard to cry into 3D glasses. <laughs> oh, I can cry anywhere, anytime, any glasses, any hat. You just need to get better at crying. I've been trying to like um, manage how much I'm going to cry in the opening by listening to the repeated Star Wars opening game. Like, All right, here's, and- here's the one thing I will say. Here's the one thing. Star starts and you just start wailing. <laughs> So that was 2015, the year of the contributor. And we couldn't have done it without your contributions. That was the most important part. Thank you for your emails, your voicemails, your medical minutes, your tech and trades, your Patreon support, your PayPal contributions, and just generally being the best audience that we could possibly ever hope for. You're the smartest, most supportive audience in podcasting. And we couldn't do it without you. 
Extra special thanks go to Rich Straffolino and Phil Shane. They logged this whole year and found all these great clips for us. Huge thanks to Bryce Castillo for editing this. And of course, never ending thanks to my producer, Jenny Josephson, for the blood, sweat, and tears that went into organizing all of this. That is it for 2015's Best Of. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You can call us 512-59-DAILY, although we won't answer the phone until after the first of the year. Catch the show live Monday through Friday after the first of the year at 4.30 p.m. Eastern on alphageekradio.com and diamondclub.tv and visit our website at dailytechnewsshow.com. Back on the next show with our quarterly analyst check-in. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs)